Thank you very much. Um, well, I was um, uh, delighted and kind of surprised to be invited to speak at this conference, so uh, it's a very great honour. Thank you. Um, obviously, I've learnt most of what I do is based on things I've learnt from Maxime's papers. Um, uh, Paul was, yeah, I mean, and then I kind of realised I was going to have to try and do some work so that I had something to talk about at the conference. Uh, so, I, yeah, I did that, but I'm not sure uh, it was effective. But, uh, I mean, Paul, actually, yeah, I mean, you were saying you were likening your progress in maths to assembling to IKEA furniture. I mean, I think for me, a better analogy is one of these crazy people who uh, makes buildings out of matchsticks. Uh, <laughs> You know, spends their entire life making a model of the Taj Mahal or something like that. Uh, anyway, so just for a change, I'm, I'm talking about stability conditions. Uh, so stability conditions are some slightly strange subject, um, uh, which arose out of out of physics, out of Mike Douglas's work in in string theory um, on on pi stability. Uh, so I think maybe. The easiest thing to do, maybe this won't be so popular, is I'm just going to write up the definition, because then we know where we are. And uh, you know we're in France, so everybody knows what a triangulated category is. So <laughs> let, me, let me just start. So, so D, uh, I should maybe start with the outside one. Huh? Oh, whatever. Yeah, that would be, it doesn't matter. OK, so D is going to be some triangulated category. Um, and I'm going to try and remember to call these things stability structures in Maxime's presence, because you know you don't like the term stability condition. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm. And also, the new thing you got variation of stability structures, but variation of force structures, variation of conditions. Yeah. yeah. Not so good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, right, so what's the stability structure on D? It's um, two pieces of data. It's a pair. Um, right, so first, um, this is the easy bit to understand. A complex valued, oh, so this is a group homomorphism from the Grotendieck group to C. Um, so this is called the central charge. Okay, and the other thing is uh, some, so, uh, so for each real number, um, <coughs> a, a full subcategory, P5 in D, so these are the, called the semi-stables of phase 5. I'm satisfying some axioms. Right? Let me uh, let me write those up. Where did I put it? There. This is not good. I hope you remember what's up there. So let you can still see it. Um, satisfying four axioms. So the first one is that uh, if I take some non-zero object in what in which is semi-stable of phase phi, then indeed um, this central charge should should lie on the ray of phase phi in the complex numbers. Okay, so you're supposed to be thinking about this one. Every, every object in my category gets mapped somewhere into the complex numbers, um, and it should lie on the, on the ray of phase phi. Um, there's some compatibility between the, the shift or suspension functor of my category and um, the grading, like this, so it just shifts the grading. Um, and then there are just two more. The first one is that if I take um, if I take uh, phi one, uh, so how do I say this? Yeah, if I take two real numbers, one of which is bigger than the other, and I take some objects 
which are semi-stable of these phases, then there are no maps. Like that. So this is kind of familiar from, hopefully from stable vector bundles or something. And then the last one is existence of hard and narrow Seaman filtrations. So for, for all non-zero objects, um, there is a canonical, I mean, you don't need to assume unique, but it follows from the other axioms that it's unique. Um, filtration. Um, so, so the factors, uh, let's call them something, are semi-stable um, and of descending phase. Okay, so when I say factor and filtration here, I'm being a little bit cavalier. Um, this is a triangulated category. So what does a filtration really mean? It just means a bunch of objects with maps between them. And the factor just means the cone on the map. Okay. Right. Uh, okay, so that's the definition. And, and, and the idea, you know, the, the thing you should think about is that you think about... Um, the Fukaya category so X is some compact Calabria threefold I mean, this is just a heuristic then how do you get to these axioms or, or this whole business you think about okay so this this category is only depending on the symplectic structure on this Kähler form but you ask, what does the complex structure, I mean, if we've, if we've actually got a complex structure on this threefold as well, what does that give for us? And it gives us two things. It gives us the central charge, which if you have a Lagrangian, you can integrate the holomorphic three-form against the Lagrangian. Okay. And it also gives you the subcategory of special Lagrangians. So that's somehow the idea that <coughs> this category only depends on the symplectic structure, but as you vary the complex structure, um, you get different subcategories of, of um, special Lagrangians sitting inside there. Okay. And we, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to understand the Fukaya category. We would like to see the mirror of this, where we take the derived category of coherent sheaves, and then we, we want to see some situation where basically as the Kähler parameters vary, you see different um, classes of um, semi-stable objects sitting inside your drive. Yes. You could call the groups we are completely irrelevant here. Yeah. Sure, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just the most familiar setting. Um, where did the board rubber go? Yeah. Um, uh, let me see, I'm going to spend the whole talk. Let's go over here. So, um, so now, now I'm just going to assume the following thing. Um, the, the, this Grothendieck group is, 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 um, is finite rank, a free, free abelian group of finite rank. This, this is not really very essential, and I'm just going to... Um, I mean, it, it holds for the examples I'm going to discuss anyway. If it's not true, you just fix some map K0D to such a such an abelian group like this, and, and then insist that the central charge, which was a map on here, factors via this, via this thing. Anyway, so for now, I'm just going to assume this. Um, and then I define stab of D to be the set of all stability structures on D, satisfying something called the support condition. which first in, appeared in a um, paper of Kinsevich and Soberman. Um, so I'm, I'm, and then the result you have is that, that um, well, firstly, that there is a natural, has a natural um, topology, Hausdorff topology, 
Um, well, that's, you know, that, that's quite easy to see. Um, but then um, the important fact is that this forgetful map sending, sending my stability structure just to the central charge, this is a local homeomorphism. So, of course, th this thing is just isomorphic to Cn. So, you, you have some complex manifold here, right? Something that's just local, well, much stronger than that. It's a complex manifold with a, a local homeomorphism to Cn. Okay. <coughs> and already you see something kind of interesting and difficult about this, which is that, uh, okay, I sort of argued heuristically that every complex structure on X should give you um, one of these one of these structures, okay, and um, this central charge is just the period of this complex structure. But, of course, you don't at all expect the moduli of complex, oh, I mean, it's just not true, the moduli of complex structures does not get mapped locally homeomorphically to a vector space by its, by its period map. Rather, you know, it cuts out some interesting transcendental submanifold of, of this, you know, Griffith's transversality and, and, and this story. So, so somehow, what we would really like to be able to see is, um, or what I would like to be able to understand is some kind of extra structure on this space of stability conditions that maybe enables you to pick out these um, special geometric stability conditions in the, in the case of a Fukai category. Okay, but I don't know how to do that. Um, right, so let me go to discuss an example. So are there any, any questions while I've got this in my hand? <laughs> um, right, so this example is um, joint work with Cho Yu and Tom Sutherland. Um, so it's a very simple example, but it has the benefit that, so, I mean, to start with, you know, this definition has been around for 10 years or so, and, you know, lots of examples of these spaces have been computed, but to start with, they tended to be um, lower dimension, kind of curves, uh, derived categories of curves and CY2 situations. But now we're getting to the stage where we can work with the CY3 cases, which are sort of the most interesting. Um, so anyway, in this case, I'm going to take um, DD, to be a CYD triangulated category, which, but a very simple one, which is the one associated to this A2 quiver. Okay. Just to see, show you what sort of things can happen. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to de denote by D infinity um, the ordinary derived category of this quiver. Maybe it se seems strange notation, but it, it makes sense, as I'll explain. So the way you should think about this is that this is generated by, by two objects. And their x groups look like as, as follows, x, x star. So these are I mean, these are spherical objects in this case. In, in the d-infinity case, they're exceptional objects because this, this isn't there at all. Um, and uh, well, this one, uh, C. So there's a unique extension in one direction and the corresponding dual thing. So it's just a very simple, about as simple as you can get, example of one of these categories. So I'm, I'm going to describe what the space of stability conditions is. Um, so to give you the answer, let me uh, introduce a little bit of notation. Of course, this is the Dinkin diagram for SU3, so you shouldn't be surprised when I write this. So I, I want to write the cartel.
Okay. And the regular part of that. Um, and what else do I want? Oh, the vial group acts on all this, which is across S3. And if I take this equation, of course, this is still just C2 with, say, coordinates A and B. And I mean, of course, the relation here is that if I write the polynomial like this, this is right. So that's just some some notation, and then the theorem. which has two parts. Um, let's see. Um, so if I take stab of um, this CYD version, um, and I mod out by a certain natural group of autoequivalences, then this is precisely H rate. Okay. And then a bit more interesting than that is what's the formula for the central charge? So, and under this isomorphism, you know, what are the central charges of these two objects? Um, you get them by taking integrals of this polynomial. Like this. Those are exactly the same integrals that you get from the symplectic geometry. Sure. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, symplectic geometers should absolutely understand exactly what is going on here. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I is on the... Are they equal? Because I isn't on the right-hand side. Uh, yeah, there's a, well, there's a path here. Gamma I. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks, Edwin. And uh, so, I mean, the picture that goes with this is, you know, this polynomial has some zeros, and these gamma I's are passed between... Yeah. yeah. But star is what the component... Yeah, so stab star is a component. There's always some small print with these theorems, right? Stab star is the only connected component I know about. And this is the group generated by uh, th th these Seidel-Thomas twists, um, but not quite in the full autoequivalence group. Inside, well, the group which preserves this, modulo those which act trivially. So I mean, you know, the, I, I'm not forbidding that there might be some crazy, there might be some autoequivalences which just act trivially here. In which case, I kill them. Okay, so. so that's uh, um, that one. And then, what about stab d infinity? Um, well, this is just isomorphic to H mod W. Um, and do you want to tell me the map, Paul? <laughs> so in this case, Z of SI is given by these oscillating integrals. Right? So e to the um, so and the picture that goes with this. Uh, of course, when you evaluate one of these integrals, it only matters what direction you go to infinity and so something. Two. Yes, that's important. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. I mean, if you want to take d equals 1, I think the correct interpretation of this would then be um, the uh, derived category of an elliptic curve, in which case this result would kind of still be true. But uh, I'm not... I'm, sorry, was there a question? Actually, the In d equals 1, you're saying? Or? Uh -huh. I'm not claiming anything about D equals 1. <laughs> it's just the ordinary derived category of this, of this quiver. Yeah. So, I mean, the motivation for the definition is that uh, the, the, the Sayre dual to x1 appears in degree d minus 1 until eventually it doesn't appear at all. So, 
Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is a very simple example, and uh, and as Paul and others have pointed out, I mean, this is exactly what you would expect from mirror symmetry and the symplectic geometry and so on. But but still, you have to prove this thing, and uh, I'm not I'm not going to explain the proof. Um, I mean, actually, it's kind of got a, a slightly 19th century feel to it. You 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 um, find a fundamental domain for this for the action of this group, map it. I mean, you can always quotient everything by a C star action, which is naturally around. So you end up with a domain sitting inside P1, and you have to work out which function maps that domain onto the upper half plane. And it turns out that these are the right functions to do that for you. So there's some kind of you know, conformal mapping type argument goes into this. Um, OK, but what I want to take from this, and maybe people will disagree, is I mean, this reminds me of, yeah, so CF, the, uh, the Frobenius structure on the unfolding space of the singularity x cubed equals zero. I mean, that's, I guess that's exactly h mod w, and the discriminant is, is this thing. And these, um, the, the things in one, these functions are called, these are called, um, uh, what are they called? Um, twisted periods. Parameter. So there's some parameter here, which is d minus two over two, um, and in two, these things are um, <coughs> deformed flat coordinates. And, and, and one other coincidence that's worth mentioning is that uh, this, <coughs> the Euler vector field, I mean, this Frobenius manifold has an Euler vector field, E, and this corresponds exactly to Z. I mean, I mean the tangent space to, to the space of stability conditions, of, of course, is just this vector space. And at each point, you have a, a particular element of this tangent space. So you have a vector field given by Z, and that corresponds to the or the vector field. Oh, uh, uh, there's a factor there, but anyway. OK, so um, my dream, or kind of I feel that you should be able to get this Frobenius structure out of the space of, you know, by thinking of categorically, you should be able to construct this Frobenius structure. I don't know how to do that yet, but that's somehow what I'm wanting to, wanting to do. Um, I think Maxim disagrees with the whole project. But you completely disagree. I think you just volume elements on more volume elements or something. Love you. Default of one fold, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, okay, you can say that, but uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm powerless to disagree because I can't prove the difference. But uh, anyway, so, uh, but but yes. Anyway, we'll, we'll go on. So, how to see. And I should say that, um, um, so I, I've only treated this quite simple example, but this is part of a, um, so let's focus on the CY3 case for the rest. Um, so this is part of some much bigger family of examples. So, um, so, so this space parameterizes, you can think of this as the set of um, uh, quadratic differentials, somewhat bizarrely, on P1 um, with pole of order 7 at infinity. I mean, and the correspondence is not so earth shattering, it's just that you consider this thing. Okay? Um, uh, with simple zeros. OK, so that sounds like a slightly mad thing to say, except that basically there is a generalization to this, of this to every space of, quadratic dif of meromorphic quadratic differentials on Riemann surfaces. So, um, so 
So this was joint work with Ivan Smith. And um, so um, and this is very very much came out of work of Gato, Moore, and Nitsky, which is that for any G greater than or equal to zero um, and non empty collection of, of pole multiplicities. So there exists some category D such that you have a similar result, stab of D. Um, is isomorphic to the space of quadratic differential of genus N on a surface of genus G with, you know, these numbers of poles. Um, with, and so these are simple zeros as well. No, so so that's a good point. So this this is roughly speaking fibering over N G K. Okay, so you first, you take um, a surface with k-marked points, um, you, you choose a complex, you know, you take a, a complex, uh, you take a Riemann surface with k-marked points, and then you consider the quadratic differentials um, on, on that surface with fixed poles at those marked points. And this space is gotten by varying all that data. You vary your complex structure and, and the other thing. Uh, and D is always, yeah, D is CY3. So, I mean, that's some big story that, it, you know, it takes a whole seminar to talk about, so. Um. Does it take a whole seminar to tell us what the map said is in that example? Uh, no, it's still the square root of the different, uh, you know, whenever you have a quadratic differential, you can take its square root and, yeah, yeah, but don't tempt me to talk about that, because I, I didn't want to. Uh, Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the, the structure you have on this space, which is, which is due to Kinsevich and Soberman, this uh, wall crossing formula. So, I mean, I, I realize this will be very kind of abstract and unpleasant for many of you, but for, for now, just if you're, if you're lost about space of stability conditions, just think that in this particular example, you have this very concrete space, which is just, you know, H reg mod, you know, th th this uh, complement of the discriminant locus, and, uh, and, and, and you have this kind of local system over it given by these, um, given by these twisted periods. So what structure do you have on this space? So let me see. Okay, so now we're in the CY3 case. I guess we have no idea what happens in higher Calabi R dimensions. And again, I'm, I'm assuming that this thing is free abelian group, and I'll probably um, call it gamma sometimes. So there is a Poisson torus, algebraic torus, um, knocking around, which is. Um, Invariantly, it's, but of course, it's just C star to the N. Um, <coughs> and what's the Poisson structure? It's, so the characters of this torus are indexed by the elements of my lattice. And because this is a Grotendieck group, it has an Euler form on it. Um, so this is. This is the Euler form, which exists on any kind of finite type triangulated category. But because this is CY3, this is skew symmetric. Okay. 
Okay, so so if you if we give me give me some stability condition now, we have the following data. So at, e at each point of this complex manifold parameterizing your stability conditions, you have the following data. So um, yeah, so a collection of what I would call active rays. So I mean, this is going to be the picture. We sort of already have this picture. So L, L I, these are the um, uh, uh, what would be the right way to say it uh, for E semi-stable. So that they're the ray. I mean, as I said, every object gets mapped somewhere into C by its central charge, and I just take the rays through the um, through the semi-stable guys. So there's um, that's you know potentially a countable number of rays. So I mean, I guess it's also I mean, by definition it's the same as this for where for all the p phi which are non-empty. You know, I mean, we had these subcategories of semi-stable objects of phase phi, but most of them are going to be going to be empty. Right, OK, so far, not very interesting. But then for each ray, a, um, a Poisson, I'm going to put automorphism in inverted commas. I'll explain this in a minute. But to first order, you should think of this as an automorphism, SL. So um, a Poisson automorphism of this torus. Um, and, and how's that defined? Well, it's pullback on functions. If I pull back a character, I get. Um, oh, sorry, what do I get? I get the exponential of the Poisson bracket of a generating. Right, okay, I can see I'm going to have to explain this. OK, so what's all this mean? So, um, so I've fixed a ray here. I'm trying to give you a Poisson automorphism for this ray. And on this ray, by definition, because it's active, there are um, semi-stable objects living on this ray. So we can count them. For each class in the gradient deep group which gets mapped onto this ray, I can count the number of semi-stable objects, where counting means take the DT invariant of the, of the moduli, moduli space of these things. Assemble this into a generating function. So this looks like a function on this torus, except that it's probably an infinite power series. So you know, we have to be worried about that. And then we take the Hamiltonian flow at time one of this, of this function. And that's supposed to give me some automorphism of this torus. Okay. Um, and I come back to in what sense it's an automorphism. <coughs> and then there's this very beautiful fact, which is the wall crossing formula. which is that if I take some a convex sector, doesn't really matter what, in C star. <coughs> okay, so, so now the picture is fixed on the sector like this. Um, and, and I vary my stability condition so that no so that um, no active ray crosses the boundary of this region, then if I take the product over all rays living in this sector of these automorphisms, then this should be constant. Okay. So, so here's the picture. Here, that, here are the active rays, and I take the uh, take the product over these in that order. 
Okay, and that looks a little bit ill-defined and so on, but it, in fact, it's absolutely fine because, because we're in a convex sector, we can choose a half plane so that all these, you know, all the classes appearing here are all positive combinations of some, of some basis, if you like. So, in other words, this makes sense in um, some automorphisms, plus on automorphisms of some ring that looks like I mean, before we were talking about a ring that looks like this. Uh, okay, so the ring, ring of functions on this torus, but uh, <coughs> because these are all positive, all these coefficients appearing here in this generating function are all positive um, in terms of this basis, then, then everything makes sense in this formal power series, power series ring. Okay, so this is a perfectly rigorous and and, and decent statement. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and where does it come from? It basically comes from the existence and uniqueness of Harder Narrow Seaman filtrations. <laughs> Although it's hard to see by now, it's been disguised. <laughs> Um, but basically, there is a, a, a formula like this holds in the Hall algebra um, almost for free, just because, I mean, that just, exp if you think of a formula like this in the Hall algebra, it just expresses the fact that every object has a unique filtration by semi-stable objects. And the really kind of amazing thing here is that there's a ring homomorphism from the Hall algebra to this, uh, well, to the quantum torus. Um, <coughs> and so you can transfer your identity to the quantum torus, and, and then you can, you can cook up this thing, which I guess is the uh, semi-classical limit. Um, and so let, let's just say what it says in this example. So again, we're taking the CY3 derived category of, of, of this thing. Then there are just kind of two possible, the two chambers in this space of stability conditions. You've either got two stable objects or you've got three stable objects. And of course, you have this as well. But anyway, let's not put the negatives on. Um, and the rays are, right, so let's, let's take a basis, the obvious basis consisting of, given by the simple at here and the simple here. Um, so what would I write here? I would probably write S alpha 1. S alpha 2, and here I would write S alpha 2, S alpha 1 plus alpha 2, S alpha 1, where S, alpha, S of any alpha um, is this cluster style transformation. So, uh, And then there is a there is a non-trivial so oh yeah so this is now I'm I'm thinking of this as now a birational automorphism of the torus. Okay, so so one thing I explained here is you can just expand all these things as power series, um, but in, in in nice situations and it's not true in general. In nice situations, this thing really does define a birational automorphism of your torus. Okay, and, and, and this is the case here. So for each of these, so as I say, there are kind of two parts of this complex manifold. In one part, there are just two stable objects up to, up to shift. And in the other part, there are three stable objects up to shift. So you get these two different regions. And so you end up, this wall crossing formula becomes this identity that S alpha 1, S alpha 2 equals S alpha 2, S alpha 1 plus alpha 2. S alpha 1, which is kind of this pentagon identity which comes up in, in cluster algebras. Okay. So it's related to the, um, the pentagon identity for the quantum dialog room. Okay. So that's just the simplest example. And I should say that in these, in these spaces I mentioned here, um, <coughs> these much more general Things. This is also true. These are always birational automorphisms. So you can, you, there may be countably many rays, but all the, uh, all the automorphisms are birational. Okay.
Any questions? I mean, I know, that, I know this looks somewhat abstract, but at the end of the day, there's something very concrete here. We just have some complex manifold. Um, you have some rays in, 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 in C, which are varying with your, uh, with your point in, as you move around in this complex manifold. These system of rays is moving. Um, to each such ray, you have a birational automorphism of a torus. And these things have the magic property that when two rays collide, the automorphism associated to the two things turns into the product of these two things. So, so that's kind of the, the structure you, you naturally have. Can you read of the petal identities directly from the structure of the like some error Um The Pentagon identity just follows from this general machinery of, uh, uh, I mean, it follows from this wall crossing identity. It's the simple example of this wall crossing identity. Yeah. Not that I know of, no. But, um, um, right, so where are we? By the time I brought that board down, I suppose. So I should remark that at least um, this stuff is, uh, <clears throat> where's my, I should find my place for My notes are a Mobius band. Um, yeah, so there's, <clears throat> there is at least here a very strong analogy with um, the Frobenius structure, which of course is, is living on the same space. I mean, no one can deny that there is a Frobenius structure on this space. And what, what that means is that, so, um, so over. Um, and so we have a, um, have a family of, or rather the points of this Frobenius manifold parameterize connections, GLN connections, meromorphic, um, on, on P1. So these things look like D minus U over T squared plus V over T. Okay, so, so this defines some, <coughs> you know, meromorphic connection on a, on a CN bundle over of a projective line with some irregular singularity at the origin and some regular singularity at infinity. And here U, um, so U is some diagonal matrix. So this is multiplication by the Euler vector field. Okay, so you're on a Frobenius manifold, you can multiply um, <coughs> tangent vectors together and V is some skew symmetric matrix. So it's the um, V, it's the gradient of V of this Euler vector field. And so what people do, or what Dubrovin explained, is that you can, um, ah, well, I guess this is not quite true. There's a diagonal bit. is that you can consider the, the kind of irregular monodromy of this connection at, at, at the origin. So that's, you know, Stokes data. So, and you get a picture like this, very similar to what we've had before. Whereas now the rays, these are the Stokes rays of this connection. So this is um, <coughs> these are spanned by the differences of the eigenvalues of this, of this diagonal matrix. Um, and you have Stokes factors, so SL, well, 
But instead of being automorphisms of a torus or anything like this, these are, these are just in GLN. Okay. But you have exactly this same, you know, this is the, now the kind of iso-Stokes property. I mean, somehow the, the big, the important thing here is that this is a nice and monodromic family of, family of connections. So you have exactly this same property, SL equals constant. OK, so again, as you move, I mean, these UIs are the canonical coordinates on this. I mean, these, these serve as a, co a coordinate system on your, uh, on your Frobenius manifold. As, as you vary around in your, in, in your Frobenius manifold, these rays can collide. But when they do, these Stokes factors uh, form a product like that. OK, so there's some. And um, and so and, and sort of given you, I mean, very roughly, V is kind of canon is uniquely determined by the set of this Stokes data. I mean, at least locally. So, so I mean. Can I just explain that just these two symmetric and just say that equality is here. So this is the identity. So this is a, a, a identity matrix, and that's the gradient of the Euler vector field. Yeah. And D is the dimension of the Frobenius manifold, which is some number. OK, so you know, maybe I'm just a sucker for analogies, but to me, these things look very similar. Okay. Um, and as I emphasize, they're, they're living on exactly the same space. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a way different kind of group, but I mean, well, let, let, let me say a little bit more. Oh, yeah, so there's one other, prop one other thing here that you have in this Frobenius manifold picture is that if you go to the, the negative Stokes ray, um, so, so these come in, you know, you can go to the opposite Stokes ray. This is kind of the same matrix, except it, well, it's, it's inverse transpose. You have this property, and this is kind of the same. This is the same thing as saying that V is skew symmetric. I mean, in other words, you could consider other connections where V wasn't skew symmetric. You would get Stokes factors, and they wouldn't satisfy this. But, but in, the, in this quantum cohomology picture, you always have this kind of happy thing going on. So let's just speculate what we might have over stab of D. Should look at. Some family of connections like this on P1, where now this group is this much bigger thing. Okay. So let's just think about the Lie algebra of this group. So that's going to be um, symplectic vector fields on my torus. So this has a bit you can think of as the Cartan. This is, uh, um, you know, rotations. This into infinitesimal just rotations. And then you have functions, I mean, Hamiltonian vector fields, right? So this is, these are given by functions on this torus, or, or yeah, I mean, either way, or uh, the group algebra of this lattice. I, I, what's, I must what's F? So F is going to be an, so, right, so this is an element of the Lie algebra of my Lie group here. This is going to be in the Cartan bit, just like that was in the diagonal bit. Um, so this is, uh, living in just the rotations of the torus, this is going to be um, a function on my, I mean, well, I'll, I'll think of it as a Hamiltonian vector field, but it's, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess I have to mod out my constants here. Yeah. And then there's one other coincidence, just like this one, which is that you have this property that d dt alpha is dt minus alpha, OK? So that's very much like this. So what that tells you is that this automorphism if you go to the negative ray, it's related to the automorphism of the torus for the other ray by conjugating by the inverse map on the torus. Okay. So what does that tell you about f? 
you know, which is the analogy of this V being skew symmetric, then F is, um, well, if we write it as, I mean, if I think of it as a function on the torus and expand it like this, it just tells me that F alpha equals F minus alpha. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying you can actually solve this. I mean, you know, so in, in the GLN case, we know how to get from Stokes matrices to this connection by inverting the irregular Riemann-Hilbert map. Well, I mean, it's a delicate thing, but we could, you know, we sort of expand that, but uh, expect that. But in, this is an infinite dimensional group. We don't really know whether we can do this, but let's just pretend we can. We will have this condition. Um, and if you think about it, what that tells you is that this function is invariant under this inverse map. So its corresponding Hamiltonian vector field fixes the identity um, and therefore induces an automorphism of the tangent space to the identity. Okay, so, so this implies that flowing um, along F um, fixes, well, fixes the identity in the torus plus induces automorphism of the tangent space, endomorphism. Okay, so this was Dominic Joyce's idea. So, so I mean, what? So what he what he then writes down is that you can say that well, I mean, if you write down this now, I mean you could you can write down what is the induced connection on on the tangent space. You see, I mean, the tangent space to the identity of this torus is the same as the tangent space to stability conditions at that point. So you can write this. Uh, where P alpha is just this reflection. Okay, and you can prove that this is a, well, I mean, formally this is a flat connection. So, so, the, uh, so the conjecture that I want to sort of try and take seriously is that this is actually, and you, you know, you can, you can assemble various bits of supporting evidence for this. I, I would claim that this is, um, is the levy chivita Connection on the Frobenius manifold. Okay, so you know, I mean, we could speculate about this in various degrees of generality, but for now, let's just do it in this A2 case, right? So there is a perfectly uh, um, concrete. Um, is this not a GLM connection? It's connection with this with values on the hugely algebra. No, because we got rid of that because ah. because um, this connection. It was, um, it had values in Lie algebra, so this F business had values in the Lie algebra of vector fields which are invariant, well, which vanish at the identity of my torus. Oh, you take tangent, so you take the tangent, right. So, so if, you, if you think, of, if you look, so, I mean, F alphas are just numbers. F alpha is just some number depending on my stability condition. Um, so this is just some linear, I mean, this is an, infi an infinite, so this is unfortunately an infinite sum of elements of, uh, of n by n matrices. Uh -huh, sorry, I apologize. Because if we consider contribution of each ray, that vector field which doesn't vanish into identity. That's right. But that's just like this. I mean, it's exactly the same relationship as going on, as, go as is going on. Well, um, you know, I mean, this relationship is a bit is a bit strange. So, again, on the, on the level of Stokes matrices, you get this relationship, which is not saying that anything vanishes at the identity. It's saying that this matrix is invariant under conjugation by the inverse map. What that tells you for this function f, in just the same way, is that you get a function which is invariant under under the um, <coughs> the inverse map. So, for now, it's infinite dimensional Lie algebra. What's the dimension? This connection, I think, of what dimension? Dimension n. I mean, the tangent. It's based on the stability conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Before you go on to the special case, can you tell us whether you know whether this is torsion free? Yes, it is torsion free. I mean, or in, in, in formal. Yeah, you, you can play a whole load of formal games, which I, you know, 
I'm not claiming that this is some major breakthrough. I mean, for one thing, it's Dominic's idea completely. It appears in a paper of his from four or five years ago now. Um, um, and for the other, I mean, we just have no idea whether these things converge, right? So, I mean, it could just be a formal game of nonsense. But in that, inside that formal game of nonsense, you can define a metric. You can say this is the Levi-Civita connection for the metric. It's torsion-free, you know, and so on. But, you know, so how long have I got? Two minutes? Uh, five. five minutes. So actually, what I, the, the thing I'm sort of, you know, I mean, as I say, this is a somewhat old story. What one really wants to be able to do is actually calculate these F alphas in some examples to see whether this makes any sense. OK, but I mean, formally, it makes sense. So, uh, let's not do a Kevin. Did I just put that one up? So, I mean, again, going, to the, uh, going back to the analogy of the Frobenius manifold, um, I, I mean, somehow the whole Frobenius manifold structure is encoded in this, in this Stokes data. And how do, you, how do you do that? You know, how do you reconstruct the uh, Frobenius manifold? You solve some Riemann-Hilbert problem. Okay, so and I, I'm just going to write down the same thing here. So you write down a Riemann-Hilbert problem, which is for maps. Um, well, I'm just going to write it into the torus. Um, <clears throat> which should have a couple of properties, which is that uh, um, I mean, this is very much GMN. Got Alto Moore, Knightsky type story. And did I ever write Dominic's name? I mean, it'll kill me if I didn't. Oh, well, too late now. Sorry, Dominic. Um, <clears throat> So again, where's our picture? So we have a bunch of rays. And let's think about, you know, we're in this nice, why don't we just do this example? Then there's just two rays, say. And what we're asking for is a function from C star into my torus, which is discontinuous across these rays and jumps precisely by this automorphism. Um, and also has some asymptotics um, at, at the origin. I mean, you know, in coordinates, this is just saying that xi h e to the zi over h tends to 1, I mean, if, you, if you write your element of your torus in, in coordinates like that. OK. And the point is, why, does, why, why is such a thing a sort of relevant thing to write down? Of course, you now want to, uh, I mean, this is for a single stability condition, you write this problem down. But now you want to think about this thing varying with, with z as well, with my stability, stability with, with my central charge. And why does that make sense? Well, precisely because these discontinuities match up. When, one of these, when two of these rays collide, the discontinuity is the kind of product of the discontinuities. I mean, that's exactly what the wall crossing formula tells you, that this is a sensible, sensible thing to write down. So how can we compute this? And it turns out that, um, well, there's a recent paper by Iwaki and Nakanishi. Um, and this is called exact WKB analysis. And, you know, I haven't processed this entirely yet, so, but I want to give you the idea because I think it's very beautiful. There's also a paper by Massa Valero, um, which exactly deals with this very, you know, exactly this example. Um, and what we're doing here is some kind of conformal limit of, of what Gaiato, Moore, and Knightsky did. Okay, so where's my last sheet? Yeah, here. So, so what do we do? We consider we consider a family of projective structures on P1 
minus infinity. So this sounds a little grand. It's going to be something very concrete in a minute. Some fixed one where, where Q of X is this thing that keeps coming out. This is this. OK, so by a projective structure, I mean you know a family of an atlas of maps to CP1 whose transition functions are in a Mobius transformations, right? So on any Riemann surface, you can consider a set of these projective structures. So I'm fixing some basic one, which is the standard one on P1. There's an obvious projective structure on P1. Um, and I'm perturbing it by this quadratic differential, because one thing you know about projective structures is that they form a, a torsor for quadratic differentials, or a, an affine space for quadratic differentials. Okay. Um, so I should say all this applies perfectly well to all these other examples. Um, but quadratic differentials. And, and what does this actually mean? I mean, so it means you should consider the, the following familiar equation. OK, I mean, that's, that's how you get, I mean, that's what this affine space thing is. It's this, uh, well, anyway, so, I mean, let me just say it like this. You consider um, a ratio of two linearly independent solutions to this equation. That will give you a map to P1 from your, uh, from your complex surface. Of course, it will go wrong at infinity, but, you know, we don't care about that. That will give me some projective structure. But... OK, and a, and a projective structure in particular, well, so I, I draw the following big diagram and then I'll sit down. So, so this, what I've just described is a way of getting yourself to meromorphic projective structures on P1. And then I want to take um, just the monodromy of this thing. So this is, this, there's a map to the wild character variety of, you know, I'm thinking here of the work of Phil Bolt, or you could also think in terms of these, I hope, um, framed local systems, um, framed PGL2 local systems of Fock Gonshaw. And the thing is, on here, you have some cluster coordinates. I mean, I mean what, what does it really mean? It means, again, you take the Stokes, you take the, uh, Stokes matrices of this equation at infinity. Um, those actually, <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, those agree with these. Uh, these fock gonshoff coordinates. And for these, th these depend on a triangulation, but of course you, yeah, anyway, that's another story, but this quadratic differential gives you a triangulation. Yeah, I realize there are lots of things I'm, I'm not really having time to explain, but okay, so I claim that the, this map gives you, the, uh, gives you so the solution to this Riemann-Hilbert problem. Okay, and I think, uh, well, this is, uh, I mean, these guys will probably kill me because I, I've rephrased what they did in, in possibly wrong thing, in a possibly wrong way. But anyway, there is this, there is this very precise and, you know, 80 or 90 page paper explaining um, the connection between cluster varieties and the WKB analysis of this, um, of, 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 of this Schrodinger equation. And, you know, it's kind of a, a beautiful story relating to Voros symbols and, and so on. But I think, you know, in, in a nutshell, this is what's going on. And I think this will provide you a way of solving this, this structure. Um, and, and so the story is not finished. I'm hoping to use this to somehow compute these, these F alphas and, and see if they, they match up. Um, but uh, until I manage to do that, I think Maxime will not believe me. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.
question? Uh, maybe I just conclude. So in, mm -hmm. in the case of this progress manifold structures in the A model, it, it should depend on only syntax structures, not quantified structures. So, so, so yes. I mean, in a kind of progress manifold structure on gram theory, it depends only on syntax structure and uh, not complex structure. So kind of why this stuff B, it should be parameterized in complex structure, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, isn't this just the, the, the mirror? I mean, I mean, roughly speaking, stability conditions, um, I mean, there are kind of two categories. We could think about the Fakaya category of X and the derived category of X. And somehow stability conditions on one, so say stability conditions on um, the derived category of X, that's like Kähler parameters. That's the same as deformations of the Fakaya category of X. And it's on that deformation space you they get all this kind of, um, you know, non-commutative Hodge structure, all this, you know, the, th the thing that uh, they studied. But mirror symmetry kind of says that these spaces should be the same or, or, or very closely related. So, but this is some completely different story, not related to directly to gromov witten invariance. Um, so, the, so this robust manifold structure is not the, but not one which came from Gromov-Witten theory. Um, <clears throat> no, I mean. It's kind of some, some, somehow correspond to the gromov witten theory of the mirror. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, what you should be thinking of is if I take stab of dx, how am I going to get a Frobenius structure on this? Well, I'm, I'm telling you that it should be something to do with dt invariance of x, but of, of x. But of course, that's kind of the same as gromov witten theory of x. And this should be something like deformations of the mirror. Um, uh, well, uh, of the, uh, yeah, this should be like symplectic structures on the mirror. Um, the of X check, no. no, no. I mean, this is the DT gromov witten correspondence. I mean, it stays on the same on the same space. Um, uh, so the, there is this Durant Thomas committing but correspondence is some way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, you can try to hook that up to give you some heuristic. I mean, I have some very heuristic argument as to why you know why this why this Lebedjevita connection is the right thing involving this DT gromov witten correspondence, but uh, but. That's certainly not in a state I can present. Okay, I don't believe you because in thesis it doesn't appear as a story. It's two D four D. It's kind of different, different story. But you agree that there is um, a Frobenius manifold structure in these examples, and there is also. It's yeah, it's not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think I already wrote many years ago about some Frobenius structure. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well. <laughs> No, I mean the fact the fact that you don't believe me is a huge motivation to try to uh, try to work out the details. I, I wish I could have done it in time, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, for the first theorem, capital computer curves like Ben and Hayden. Ah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, yes. Thank you. I mean, that's a very important remark. Um, so, I mean, this first theorem I stated, I was in too much of a rush. I mean, various parts of this had been proved before by various people, but uh, like Richard Thomas and. Who's even here? But uh, and, and Alistair King, but most in, yeah, and, and then there are these these people. But, but I mean, the absolutely <laughs> the most important thing is that there's this guy Aikido, um, who um, scooped us. He not only proved this theorem before us, well, part A, part, part one, but he did much better because he did not just A two but all A N. Okay, so he absolutely blew us out of the water, and it's kind of criminal to forget. So, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, I mean. Question. Um, Dubrovin um, studied the powers of the Euler vector field uh, and because they satisfy this nice leap. I mean, obviously, in the semi simple case, it's obvious what they do. They're mm -hmm. just like vector fields on the line. And I'm just curious if one could hope to find formulas for, the, for these powers. I don't know. You're going to have to explain, explain that to me later. Sorry, I'm here. Yeah. They seem to be, yes. Yeah. Are what? Are these Voros symbols? Which you also mentioned in your paper, right? The, 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 I mean, there is, I mean, so these people have studied the Schrodinger equation. I mean, obviously, people have studied these kinds of equations. I mean, this is a Schrodinger equation in a cubic potential. I mean, people have studied this since the 30s, I guess. And uh, there are many results, but particularly this Voros. Um, there's a paper of Voros from the 80s which introduced these things which turn out, I think, to be the same as these cluster coordinates. Um. Okay. So, I suggest that further questions be saved for the coffee break, which is now down to 15 minutes. Let's thank them. Great fun talk.